Now, for those of you that take notes, I'm going to give you the four main divisions of this chapter, but then I will announce these again as we go through in case you don't get to jot them all down. But we will see here in verses one to five, the plan. We'll see a plan. In verses six through 21, I titled Proceeding as Planned. In verses 22 to 25, I titled Promises Kept. In verse 26, Prophecy. And they all start with a P. Did you see that alliteration? That's because alliterations are just so godly. And so uh, we're going to work our way through each of these sections and cover the entire chapter. But let me give you some background so that you understand why we are in Joshua chapter 6 and what it is that's happening. Now, back way back in the book of Genesis, a long time before Joshua chapter 6, there was a young man named Joseph who went to Egypt. And it's quite extraordinary how he ended up there. Uh, but he was directed by God there. And the book closes on, on uh, Joseph and his family there. By the time Exodus, the book of Exodus opens up, it's quite a, quite a, a few years later, and uh, there are potentially millions of uh, Israelites or children of Israel that came from Joseph's family and, and all of his family, and they really are filling up Egypt. Well, things in Egypt changed for them. They had been very much welcomed there, but by the time Exodus opens up, they are no longer welcomed welcome there. There's a new Pharaoh. And they end up enslaving the Israelites there in Egypt. Well, God comes up with a plan, obviously has a plan to rescue his people from slavery from Egypt. And so the book of Exodus is about God using a man named Moses to lead the people out of Egypt and toward something called the promised land, the land of Canaan, which is now presently the land of Israel. And so God sets about doing just that. The book of Exodus is about God pulling his people out of Egypt. We then get into Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, and those books are about God taking Egypt out of his people. Do you understand what I'm talking about? You got saved at some point in the past. God took you out of the world. And since that day, he has set about the business and the process of then taking the world out of you. Amen, church? We understand? Good. Okay. And so he's been doing that through Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. At the end of Deuteronomy, Moses is a very old man, and uh, he dies, and God appoints Joshua as the next leader. Joshua had served under and with Moses for 40 years, and so God chooses him after all that 40 years of training to assume the position of leader. And so Joshua, in the first few chapters of Joshua chapter 5, he gets them to uh, the border of the the Jordan River, and they're there. And in chapters 3 and 4, we see that God miraculously opens up the Jordan River, and uh, Joshua uses, or or rather, uh, Joshua leads the people through the Jordan River uh, into the land of Canaan. They're now in the land of Canaan, into the promised land. So they went from the east side of the Jordan across to the west side of the Jordan, And uh, they're there at a place called Gilgal. That's where they're camped out on the plains of Jericho. Ah, now, Joshua chapter 6, here we are. We're on the plains of Jericho waiting to go in and take over Jericho. You see, that's what God had told them to do. You're going to go to this new land that I'm giving you, this promised land. When you get there, yes, there are cities and there are people, but the people are wicked. And God was going to use his people to judge those people by sending them in to take over that uh, area, that land, that, that country. And so that's what's happening, and we're right here at the beginning. We're on the threshold of it. And here is Joshua about to lead the people. And so the plan is given. Let's look at verse 1. Now Jericho was securely shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. We will hear about a young lady named Rahab today through our study. There are a few verses. But uh, there were two spies that had previously been sent from Israel, and they met this woman named Rahab. She was one of the people that lived in Jericho. And she reported to them, she says, listen, everyone here in Jericho, everybody in in this new land, everybody is terrified of you guys because we've heard the stories. She testifies to them, 
And she's from the land of Canaan, but she says to them, listen, we've heard about all that God has done for you, and everyone here is terrified. And she ends up making a deal with them. It's quite a, a, a prosperous de uh, deal, and we'll get to that in a little bit as we move on. But notice this, this, the beginning of this is that Jericho is shut up. Nobody can go out, no one can came, come in. That is extremely important as we continue on in our study. Now, in verse two, we find out where the plan comes from. Look at verse two. And the Lord said to Joshua, see, I have given Jericho into your hand, its king and the mighty men of valor. So it becomes clear to us there in verse two that this plan is from the Lord, if you are taking notes. It's plain to see there in verse two, and the Lord said to Joshua. Now, that is important also. Obviously, everything in here is important, but it is important to understand that this plan came from God, okay? Everybody's got that? The plan came from God, okay? God had given the plan to Joshua, okay? What's the big deal with that? You'll see why. Because in verse three, the plan involves marching, Verse three, you shall march around the city, not in it, not through it, not over it, around it. All you men of war, so call out all of the, the fighting men, the military men, you shall go all around the city once. This you shall do six days. Now, I am not a military man. I was never in the military. One of my, actually one of my great regrets was having not served. Uh, my dad did, I did not. I was uh, an entirely different person back then. But not a military man, but it doesn't take a military person to understand that this is not a good plan of attack. Walk around the city once a day for six days. Okay. Okay, let's hear the rest of the plan before we judge. In verse four, we find out that the plan from the Lord involves not only marching, but also trumpets. Now, now we're talking. I really, really like jazz. Old jazz, straight ahead jazz. Some of you straight up jazz. Some of you know what I'm talking about. And uh, trumpeteers, trumpets, I love, you know, all the horns and everything. And so now we're talking, verse four, and the seven priests, he's told by the Lord, and this is what Joshua is told, and seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. Now, let me stop to explain the ark. That is not the, uh, no, that's not Noah's ark. It's not a big boat, not a big ship. Uh, you, many of you have seen Indiana Jones. When I say the ark, you know, oh, Indiana Jones and, you know, the ark, and you understand that. And it was actually very similar to that. Um, this, the ark was a large box that was made out of special wood and it was covered in gold. And that box uh, had been made uh, by, you know, during Moses' time, but there were specific instructions that were given to Moses about how to make it, and it needed to be a certain size and all of this so that they could put specific items in there that God wanted them to store and save in there. But there was also a gold cover on the top of it, and this gold cover uh, was completely gold, so it was quite heavy. And on the ends of that gold cover, it had two angels that had been formed out of gold there. And uh, those angels were facing one another, and they were referred to in the Bible as cherub. And no, they were not chubby little naked angels, but they were called cherub, and there's, so these, there's two angels. Well, what was special about that was that God had said to Moses and to the people, you're going to make this seat, this, this cover to cover the ark. And then he told them that will become what's called the mercy seat. And God had explained to them that he would meet with them beyond that seat between those two angels. So this ark that they are covering or carrying rather this box is not just some box, but it is representative and symbolic of God being there with them. That's where God meets with us in between those two angels on that mercy seat. Now, it's not that God was stuck in between there or that, you know, he didn't have a home and that was his home or anything like that, but that was the place where he had said, I will meet with you here. So it was symbolic of the presence of God. And so it says in verse four that the seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram, ram's horns before the ark. Notice the order. There are priests with horns in front of the ark. Goes on to say in verse four, but the seventh day, now we're talking six days, walk around. All right, 
But the seventh day, you shall march around the city seven times. Okay, now we're talking seven times, yes. And the priests shall blow the trumpets. Okay, got it. That's part two of the plan. Sound exciting? Walk around, priests blow trumpets, big parade. Okay, when is the, when is the fight? When's the, when do we attack the wall? Verse five, we find out that there's a third element to this plan. And it involves shouting. So we have marching and trumpets and shouting. Wow, this is sounding great. Verse five, it shall come to pass when they make a long blast with the ram's horn and when you hear the sound of the trumpet that all the people shall shout with a great shout, then the wall of the city will fall down flat and the people shall go up, every man straight before him. Okay, we got it. We're gonna walk around the city once a day for six days. And then um, on the seventh day, we're going to walk around seven times. And then the priests will blow their ram's horns, their trumpets, and then all of us will shout and the wall will fall down. Does that sound like a military conquest to you? Like a, a, a good solid military plan of, and campaign against attacking a city? Those city is shut up. No one can go out, no one can go in. It's impenetrable. This doesn't sound like a very good plan to me, at least not if I am a military person or a military general wanting a plan of attack on this city that we need to destroy, that God told us to, to destroy. So we move on to find out more into our second main division, which is proceeding as planned. And in verses six through 14, I titled six days. So here are the first six days. Here's the description. Verse six, then Joshua, the son of Nun, called the priest and said to them, take up the Ark of the Covenant. There it is, it's the Ark or the Ark of the Covenant. Sometimes it's called the Ark of the Testimony. But he says to them, take up the Ark of the Covenant and let seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Ark of the Lord. Same thing, Ark of the Covenant, Ark of the Testimony, the Ark, the Ark of the Lord, all synonymous. And he said to the people in verse seven, proceed and march around the city and let him who is armed advance before the ark of the Lord. Okay, now we're talking. Those people that are armed are to walk up front. Got it. So we've got soldiers with some kind of weapons. We've got priests with ram's horns. We've got the ark of the covenant. Let's go on to find out what else. Verse eight. So it was when Joshua had spoken to the people that the seven priests bearing the seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Lord advanced and blew the trumpets and the ark of the covenant of the Lord followed them. The armed men went before the priests who blew the trumpets and the rear guard came after the ark while the priests continued blowing the trumpets. Okay, so we've got some soldiers and priests up front. We've got the Ark of the Covenant in this procession. We've got some more uh, soldiers behind. We've got all of the people following behind. Got it. Here's the procession. Here's the parade. We've got the order. Now we're marching. This is the six, six days though. And so it goes on to say in verse nine, the armed men went before the priests who blew the trumpets and the rear guard came after the Ark while the priests continued blowing the trumpets. Now Joshua had commanded the people saying, you shall not shout or make any noise with your voice, nor shall a word proceed out of your mouth until the day I say to you, shout, then you shall shout. Now, this plan, uh, while sounding uh, like kind of a weird, weak plan, it was fine for most of us. We go, well, you know, this is God and you know, he does strange things. But this next part, I think, would probably prove to be quite stressful for some of us. Because part of the plan was to walk around the city and not make a noise. Do not talk. And some of you have a hard time not talking. You want to tell everybody everything. And with the invention of the interweb and social media, we just tell people all our business. 
here's my kids. Here are my grandkids. Here's my meatloaf. Here's a picture of my grass. We just love to tell people everything, man, everything. And some of us have a hard time not talking. Now, most of you probably will not believe this. Some of you will go, no, I, I, I know him a little bit better and he's absolutely correct. I, I actually consider myself to be an introvert. I'm, I'm, I'm a forced extrovert. I did not want to be a pastor. This is what God called me to. And being a pastor involves talking to people. Who would have thought? I, I do, you know, I, I enjoy talking to people, I guess, but I'm perfectly fine not talking to people. And it's hard for me even to carry on a conversation. That may be hard for you to believe. Again, this, this, is, this is the most talking that I do when I'm teaching here or in the high school uh, uh, room. And I have discovered a little secret. I'll share it with those of you that are introverts. It's hard for me to carry on a conversation, but I have learned over the years that if I want to carry on a conversation, ask the other person questions about themselves because people love to talk about themselves. <laughs> now, that fails if I'm face-to-face -face with another introvert because they don't want to talk, and then it's like, okay, I guess the conversation's over. Walking around the city for me and not saying anything and just listening to jazz music that sounds just fantastic. Going for a walk, I like to go for walks, this is great. But some of us would have a very difficult time with this. We'd be trying to snap selfies and pictures and here's a picture of the wall and here's a picture of the sand and here's a picture of a scared person up at the top and we'd, we, we would have a very difficult time not making any noise, but this is part of the plan. Don't say anything, he tells them in verse 10. Don't shout, don't make any noise with your voice, nor shall a word proceed out of your mouth. Can you feel the tension rising already? So in verse 11, he had the ark of the Lord circled the city, going around it once. Then they came into the camp and lodged in the camp. That's it. Six days, once a day, go around and come back. Either blow the trumpets, but come back. And Joshua rose early in the morning, and the priests took up the ark of the Lord. Then seven priests bearing seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord went on continually and blew with the trumpets. And the armed men went before them, but the rear guard came after the ark of the Lord while the priests continued blowing the trumpets. And the second day they marched around the city once and returned to the camp. So they did six days. That's it. Now again, if you are devising a plan of attack, it seems that it would be best to sneak up on the city, catch them off guard, catch them by surprise, attack before they're ready. But God doesn't need to sneak up. He says, no, I want you to walk around the city. They'll see you. They'll know that you're there. And if they don't see you, you'll blow the trumpets and they'll, they'll know that you're there. So, so now, not only are they walking around the city, they can't say anything, but there's horns blowing. Uh, and this is not a really good plan of attack, but now they're announcing their presence. We're here to destroy you. We do not know how that's going to happen, but we're here. And you can feel the tension rising as each day they walk around. The people are quiet. Sound of the horns blowing must have been absolutely disheartening and haunting to the people inside of Jericho. What do these horns mean? Why aren't they doing anything? All they're doing is walking. And then finally on the seventh day, it's seven times around. And you must uh, imagine the people of Jericho looking down and saying, here they are again, it's the seventh day, it's been a week, and here they go, wait a minute, wait a minute. They're going around again. Wait a minute, they're going around again. And time after time, seven times, and they're blowing these trumpets. Terrifying, I think. And so the tension building inside of the city, tension, I would imagine, building outside of the city among the children of Israel as they march and get closer and closer to that time when God's going to do something and the people that couldn't talk, you know, not allowed to talk, all of the tension is building. And so in verses 15 through 20, still in that same section, which is proceeding as planned, we saw the six days, but now we see the seventh day in verses 15 through 20, if you're taking notes, the seventh day. And it came to pass, I'm sorry, but it came to pass on the seventh day. 
that they rose early, about the dawning of the day, and marched around the city seven times in the same manner. On that day only, they marched around the city seven times. And the seventh time it happened, when the priests blew the trumpets, that Joshua said to the people, shout, for the Lord has given you the city. And he goes on, now the city shall be doomed by the Lord to destruction, it and all who are in it. Only Rahab the harlot shall live, she and all who are with her in the house, because she hid the messengers that we sent. And you, by all means, abstain from the accursed things, lest you become accursed when you take of the accursed things and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. But all the silver and gold and vessels of bronze and iron are consecrated to the Lord. They shall come into the treasury of the Lord. So Joshua gives some clear instructions. But the clear instructions begin with that trumpet blast and then the instructions shout for the Lord has given you the city. Now, it is important that you and I notice why they are shouting. They are shouting, he gives them the reason, because the Lord has given you the city. We'll get back to that in a few moments. You will notice that they are not allowed to take any of the accursed things. That means any of the idols, any of the gold objects, silver objects, bronze objects that the Canaanites were so involved in worshiping. Do not take any of those things. The city is going to be destroyed. Anything of worth needed to be taken for the treasury of the Lord. Why? Because the first fruits always go to God. The first always goes to God. That's why so many of you faithfully giving your tithes and offerings at the beginning, that first paycheck, man, you're like, all right, cut a check for the Lord or give online, you know, and it's, it's his. It's, 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 it's gone. It's no longer mine. It's his. It's where it was established here in the Old Testament. And so they're told here, don't take anything. And then finally in verse 20, so the people shouted when the priests blew the trumpets. And it happened when the people heard the sound of the trumpet and the people shouted with a great shout that the wall fell down flat. Then the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city. Now, this reminds me of a video uh, that I have saved on YouTube. And every once in a while I watch it and then I will send it to my family again. And this, this video is a video of a... I guess I was going to, I call it a funeral procession, but it actually is a memorial procession because a gentleman has died and all of his friends gathered together the way that they do in Nolens, New Orleans. And they all got together and they marched through the neighborhood with their horns and instruments and all of their craziness. And they were playing when the saints go marching in in honor of their friend who had died. And I tell my family, listen, when I die, you gotta do this for me. <laughs> I love jazz. Did I mention that already? And so all of you, you're invited. And I know some of you, you know, you, you, you play instruments, you bring those instruments. And you march and, you know, if they carry my casket or don't, who cares, I'm gone. I don't, who, I, what will I care? But what a wonderful thought that these people are marching all around the city and man, there's, you know, they're, they're blowing the trumpets and then finally the release of tension when they blast with those trumpets finally on the seventh time and then Joshua yells out to everybody, now's the time, you gotta shout. Imagine all of those people who have been dying to say something, man, and all of a sudden they just burst, burst forth and everyone begins to shout. And to their amazement, it says in verse 20, the people shouted with a great shout, and then the wall fell down flat. Wow. It reminds me of Matthew chapter 10. When Jesus was speaking to his disciples, and he said, whatever I tell you in the dark, speak in the light. And what you hear in the ear, preach on the housetops. God had given private instructions to Joshua. And those private instructions just became a public victory. That's what we're to do. We 
learn from God's word right here on a Sunday morning or on Wednesday night. And then, and then the point is, the point is not to stay in this church as long as we possibly can. The point is to get out of here as fast as humanly possible and go over to uh, the, the, the place that you go eat breakfast or lunch or go to the mall or whatever it is that you're doing and look for someone that you can tell what you learned this morning. That's the point. This is not for us to save and bury in some treasure chest somewhere. It is to be proclaimed from the rooftops. In verse 21, it says, and they utterly destroyed all that was in the city, both man and woman, young and old, ox and sheep and donkey with the edge of the sword. Now, this is, uh, let me mention this real quickly. This is a point of contention for many critics of the Bible. They say, look, why, why did God kill all of these people in the Old Testament? And that is, that is a question that uh, uh, you need to go and investigate on your own. But let me briefly tell you, these people that are being destroyed from the city of Jericho and all of the cities throughout the land of Canaan, let me tell you how bad it got. Their worship involved sacrifice, burning to death their own children. We're not talking about the Bradys here. We're not talking about Ward and June. These are wicked people. These people that are being destroyed were having sex for their worship with everything that moved and even sometimes with things that didn't move. You do not believe me? It's very simple. You can Google it yourself. Go find out what was worship like in the land of Canaan. Find out for yourself. These were not wholesome good people. These were people that had violently turned their back on the Lord and God was judging them. But here we find out that the city is utterly destroyed. Now, we move on into verse 22 where we see that some promises are kept. And verse 22 says, but Joshua had said to the two men who had spied out the country. I'll explain. Go into the harlot's house. What did we just hear on a Sunday morning? go into the harlot's house and from there bring out the woman and all that she has as you swore to her. Now family, let me ask you a question for a moment here. If you and I found out that God was on his way to destroy Paris, Paris, France, Some of you are not quite sure what the other ones are laughing about. Don't even go look it up. If God were on his way to destroy Paris, France, there are a great many of us who would say good riddance. Who would literally say, to hell with you all. But let me, let me ask you a question. If God was going, on, if he was on his way to destroy Paris, and he said, I am going to save one person, one family in Paris. Who do you suppose he would save? Maybe some well-known pastor. Maybe some dear old saint. Some religious icon. Some political leader. Can you imagine in your wildest dreams that God would say, I'm on my way to destroy Paris, France. I'm gonna save one person. I'm gonna save a prostitute. You know, when I was 20 years old, I was an absolute dirt bag. I would have stolen something from your car. If you left, left it online, I would have stolen something from your car in a heartbeat. Places that I worked at, I took money right out of the register. Stole products that I was supposed to be given out. Stole bicycles and all sorts of things. Absolute dirt bag. And I found out at the age of 20 years old that God saves 
from the uttermost to the guttermost. And God came looking. God came, look, God, you're never going to believe what God did. God went to San Bernardino. <laughs> and he found a 20-year-old little boy is what he found. And saved his life. This is, this is no surprise. It's a surprise to us. You want to you applaud God for that? That's good. That's a good thing. Yeah. Yeah, you're like, this is, man, it's exciting. Now I know that my car is safe around Pastor Chris. <laughs> it's a surprise for us. It's no surprise for God. He did the same thing. The book of John. Jesus had to go through Samaria. No, he did not. But he did. There was a woman there a loose woman, and he needed to go save her. And that's exactly what he did. Now, it says in verse 23, and the young man who had been spies went in and brought out Rahab, her father, her mother, her brothers, and all that she had. So they brought out all her relatives and left them outside the camp of Israel. If you're taking notes, the promises kept were by both parties. It's on the screen for you, by both parties. The spies had promised to Rahab. Rahab had actually, the spies had come into Jericho and she had intercepted them and hid them so that they wouldn't be caught and taken away. And then after she said, okay, but let's make a deal. She says, I know, I know. She told them, I believe what, what's, what God has done. She believed it. She was a believer in God. And she told the two spies, I know that God is with you. I want you to save me when you guys come back to destroy Jericho. And they made a deal. They said, okay, but here's the deal. If you and whoever it is that you want saved are not in this house, in your apartment with you, we make no guarantees. They, they will not be saved. Whoever it is that you want saved has to be in your house. And they both kept their promises. Joshua said, hey, go look for Rahab and her family. The two spies went. They found Rahab in her home with her family, just as she has said. And it says in verse 24, but they burned the city and all that was in it with fire. Only the silver and gold and the vessels of bronze and iron they put into the treasury of the house of the Lord, all except one. We'll find out what that was all about later. And Joshua spared Rahab the harlot, her father's household and all that she had. So she dwells in Israel to this day because she hid the messengers whom Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. Now look at verse 26. There's this prophecy that Joshua announces. Verse 26. Then Joshua charged them at that time saying, cursed be the man before the Lord who rises up and builds the city, Jer this city Jericho. He shall lay its foundation with his firstborn and with his youngest he shall set up its gates. And he pronounces this prophecy. How strange, right? It's strange until you get to 1 Kings chapter 16, if you're taking notes. We can't go over it right now, but you can go back and look at it. It's strange until you get to 1 Kings chapter 16, and you read about a man named Hiel, and what he tried to do, and what he did, and what he lost in the process. I'll let you guess at what that might be. And in verse 27, it says, so the Lord was with Joshua, and his fame spread throughout all the country. You bet it did, because the Lord was with him. Now, I would submit to you that this battle of Jericho, as it's so often so commonly called, the battle of Jericho, Joshua fought the battle of Jericho. Our little, our, our little kids learned those songs. Joshua fought the battle of Jericho. And the walls came tumbling down. I would submit to you that this, this is not the battle of Jericho. The battle of Jericho, where was that? What battle was there? Some people yelled at the wall and it fell down. That's no battle. So why do we call it the battle of Jericho? It doesn't say that it was a battle. This is what we call it. This was no battle, no battle for Jericho. This was something much more important. This was a battle for belief. God gave them step-by-step -step instructions. The question was never, the question was never whether Jericho was going to survive the day or not. The question all along was, were they going to believe God? 
when he said, I'm going to destroy the city in this fashion? That's the question. What were they going to believe? And you and I, in a room this size, and there are not thousands in here, but there's enough in here, some of you have recently been diagnosed with cancer. Some of you have recently been diagnosed with some other disease, some other sickness. Some of you are facing divorce. Some of you are facing problems and issues at work or at school or in your family. Parent problems, kid problems, monumental issues, walled cities where no one can get in, no one can get out, impenetrable. Let me ask you something. Is, there any, is, is cancer too big for God? It feels like it, but it isn't. Are people problems too big for God? Mm -mm. No, no. Was Jericho too big for God? Jericho was never even the issue. Never even the issue. The question, the battle was always whether they were going to believe God or not. And it's the same question that I proposed to you this morning. Okay, so you've been diagnosed with a disease. I do not mean to make light of it. In fact, it may take your human life. I mean, all of us are going to die of something. I had a friend named Roberto from Cuba, escaped Cuba years, years ago. And at the previous church that I was at, I was in the hallway on a Sunday night greeting people. This man, elderly man, comes in. I said, Roberto, como estas? Don't get all excited. It's, that's all the Spanish I know. <laughs> Some of you are like, oh, no, you know Spanish. Oh, finally, you know. I said, Roberto, como estas? Ah, oh, bien, gracias. Gracias a Dios. Thank, thank, thanks to God. And I said, how you doing? He said, oh, doing okay. The doctors, he just strutted in. The man said, oh, the doctors told me I have cancer. I don't have long to live. My, my jaw dropped. I said, I said, what? He said, he said to me, oh, God's got to take me somehow. And then he just walked away into the sanctuary to go worship, left me standing there with drool just hanging out of my, my mouth. All of us have to die from something unless the Lord raptures us first. But are these things too big? No, they're not too big. And they're going to come. Maybe you haven't had any big problems, you haven't been diagnosed with anything. Listen, let me bless your heart this morning. They're coming. That's what this world has to offer. Sickness, death pain. Are there a lot of beautiful things? Absolutely there are. Things are coming your way if they're not here already. And the question is not, is this, is this issue, this problem too big for God? That's, that's, that's not even an issue. The issue is, are you going to believe God as he leads you through the valley of the shadow of death. He didn't say we're going into the valley of the shadow of death and we're gonna set up camp and stay there. He did not say that. He said we're gonna, we're gonna be led through the valley of the shadow of death. Jericho, that was a dot on the map. The question was, were the people going to believe God? Were they going to admit we've walked around this city third times in a week, there's no way for us to get in. We've got no catapults, we've got no ladders, we've got no ammunition, we've got nothing that is going to help us take down these walls. Thirteen times they had to walk around that city so that they could be convinced there ain't no way for you to do it, Buster. You can't do it. God's going to have to do something. And God gave them the privilege of yelling at the wall. And did you notice, let me point it out to you again. Did you notice what Joshua told them in verse 16? Shout, not at the wall, not at the people, but just shout for the Lord has given you the city. It's already yours. So they had to shout, the walls are still standing. Shout because the Lord has given you the city. But the, but the city's still standing. You gotta shout. Shout, and then the walls come tumbling down. Now, why was this 
so successful. Let me share a few things with you that are not on the screen, so you got to pay attention. Wake up. we got to finish this thing up real quick here. There are four things that I see that gave to their success. Number one, their plan was a God-given plan. Remember I told you the Lord spoke to Joshua. It was a God-given plan. You come up with your own plan, you're going to fail miserably or succeed even more miserably. Because if you succeed, you'll stop trusting the Lord altogether. Stop. Take some time. Seek the Lord. God, what do you want to do? What's the plan, God? It was a God-given plan. Secondly, the plan was received by faith without doubting. There's no record of Joshua ever saying, well, you know, I don't know if that's going to happen. I, you know, Joshua's a military man. I, you know, God, eh. he said, okay, got it. That's what you want me to do? Done. We have to receive that message from God, that plan from God, receive it without doubting, by faith without doubting. Thirdly, it was carried out without doubting. The people just did it. They just walked around the city 13 times, never saying anything until the very end. And then they yelled because the Lord had given them the city. And did you notice, here's the fourth thing. Their plan had God at the center of it. Think back. Military, priests, ark, more priests, rear guard. What was in the center? God. God was always at the center of it. If you are devising a plan and God is not at the center of it, it's the wrong plan. Ditch it as fast as you can. And then seek God for his plan. But how did the walls fall? Let me show you something from Hebrews chapter 11, the hall of faith. Look at this. In Hebrews chapter 11, verses 30 through 31, it says, By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they were encircled for seven days. And then it even has... Our lady of the hour, Rahab, by faith, the harlot, Rahab, did not perish with those who did not believe when she had received the spies with peace. By faith. The walls fell by faith. But faith in what? Faith in essential oils? That's okay if you want to use them. I'm not, I don't have a problem with that. So they smell good. Faith in what? You're going to Google and search and find videos on YouTube and Instagram and TikTok and find out all the different cures and ways that you can defeat this thing in your life? Is that what you're going to place your faith in? Faith in what? Let me call your attention as we close to verse 2. And the Lord said to Joshua, see... I have given, it's past tense, church. Jericho was never an issue. Jericho was doomed. Jericho was done. They had one week. That's it. I have given. Faith in what? It was faith in what God had already promised, what God had already declared, what God had already done, and in God's mind and in his heart, it was complete. It was a done deal. You see, it's the same thing that many of you, we, we, we all got saved, I got saved 30 years ago. You got saved whenever it was that you got saved, but what you did to get saved was you placed your faith in something that God had done, past tense. Some 2,000 years ago, Jesus was born into this world. And the account, the biblical account says that he lived a sinless life. That he then died on a Roman cross at the hands of the Romans and the Jews and anybody else that was within earshot. His mom saw him and testified that he was dead. The disciples knew that he was dead. The women knew that he was dead. Pilate knew that he was dead. The Roman guards knew that he was dead. Everybody knew that he was dead. He died. He didn't swoon. He didn't fall asleep for a little while. He was dead. Then the Bible says that three days later, he rose from the grave, literally got up, walked out of the tomb. 
appeared to different people for several days and then ascended to the right hand of the Father and finished what he had been sent to do. We believe that. We placed our faith in that and we got saved at some point in the past. But now you and I are faced with some Jericho, something that stands in the way of progress. And now we find ourselves doubting. Why? You think back. From the day that you got saved until this day, has God ever not been faithful? I've never, all, all these, I've, I've never even missed a meal unless I wanted to. God has always provided. There's never going to be a time when he's not faithful, church. It cannot happen. I know it sounds strange, but he is incapable of being unfaithful. It cannot be so. He has been faithful every day. Why would he now stop being faithful? But some of us are struggling. Our doubt is getting the best of us because you're looking at Jericho instead of looking at the Lord. And I don't want to place my faith and my style the way, oh, look at the way I march around the city, man. I got to strut. That's what God used. No. Well, maybe it was the trumpet playing. No, wasn't that either. Well, maybe it was the shout. I did a really good job shouting. No, it wasn't that. It was God. He gave you a part to play in it, but it was God. It's always been God. It's always going to be God. And so whatever it is that you are facing or you are going to face, the question is not, it's Jericho, it's wall, we can't get in, we can't get out. The question is, are you going to believe God when he tells you when to move, how to move? That's the question. That's the battle, is whether I will trust God or not.